Welcome to episode 8 of Tech Tree Now with my fellow awesome compadres. Hello there, Shaban. Hello, everyone. And hi, Partha. Hey, guys. Uh, hey, Chirag, Shaban. I hope you all had a great two weeks. Right, so we've got, uh, you know, we've got some fun stuff lined up, but uh, we're going to open with uh, the Q&A section because we have a follow-up question to the question we answered last week. Back again from Judy Prosetio. He had asked us about manufacturers. They've stopped making removable batteries. And whether we thought that, that would be the case, I think the consensus was pretty much that we don't think manufacturers are going to do that. Um, so he's followed up with saying that while that makes sense, um, it doesn't actually solve my personal need, which is to be able to completely switch off my phone in certain situations, uh, sometimes because it's a time thing, sometimes it's for privacy reasons. And so do you guys have any recommendations on how we can be very sure that our phone is properly turned off and not doing any activity, including the ability to turn itself back on without you know, the ability to take out the battery. I think there is no way to know for sure unless you turn your cell phone off completely and it's not running. The paranoid tin tinfoil hat person in me will probably think that even maybe that's not enough. But uh, I think if you're having those kind of conversations, you shouldn't be having a phone next to you to begin with um, at all, period. You shouldn't have a cell phone in that room. Um, having said that... Um, I think it depends on which device you have. And if you're the kind of person who's sure of their cell phone device, you don't have any weird apps running in it, putting it on airplane mode should be enough. If you're paranoid, then of course, please switch it off. Uh, put it inside a microwave so that absolutely nothing gets out. Nothing gets in. A microwave is basically um, acts like a Faraday cage. And uh, that'll be enough of that. You can have whatever conversation you want and hear nothing. If you want to test that out you can try calling your phone i guess when it's on a, inside a microwave and see if it works and if it doesn't um and if you really 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 want to i think uh drill down and and, and do something like from those science fiction films uh get yourself just one of those isolating faraday cages that you can put stuff in and uh that definitely will will block anything all radio signals coming into your device and it's not just radio i'm talking also about sound as well so uh, make sure your device is off so there's no power so if you put it in a Faraday cage and it can hear you it doesn't really matter because it could still be recording locally uh, and transmitting that information later when it does get a network that was that was a good idea I, did, I hadn't thought of us like doing a microwave thing and the other thing would be like I mean if you're really going to it's like you can drain out the battery like that's the other thing you can do like you can absolutely drain it out um, and then the phone can't even if it wanted to power itself up it couldn't because there's no battery to do like to take on the OS anyway even though the clock and things would work uh, but yeah that, w that was my only suggestion so it's actually quite a, uh, a weird question to ask to be honest like how do you ensure that the phone is completely switched off I mean what you guys are suggesting are solid ideas but they're only theoretical because I don't think anybody consumer driven would actually want to do any of those things even when I had the option to remove a battery, I don't think I would ever uh, feel the need to kind of completely switch off my phone. I mean, I'd assume that when I switch it off, it stays switched off. Like even my phone, like the S7 Edge, has a, uh, had the non-removable battery. But when I switched it off, it stayed switched off. Unless there was pressure on the power button. No, I think you're right. The, the, the user is just probably is, is saying, hey, how do you... Like, let's say you were, you know... Um, I don't know. You're having a conversation about the deep state. I don't know. And this guy is really, he was like, I, when I, when I put my phone off, how do I know it's really off? And it's not just the screen that's turned off and the buttons unresponsive. So we're just trying to address that, but you're right. For the average consumer, there should be no need for it. And if you're concerned, again, if you're concerned, uh, you're having a sensitive conversation, you don't want your phone there. Don't have your phone there. Just, just don't. It's the easiest thing. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, that's my suggestion. Yeah. Yeah, no, so all there are the options of buying non-smartphones. You buy a feature phone and you're sorted. I mean, even in that case, like, if, if that is actually a concern, don't buy a phone. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I don't think, we, I mean, you know, working within the parameter of the question, I think, like, it's it's a case of saying, okay, I've got the phone, but how do I limit it in certain situations rather than, you know, someone that's working in, I don't know, defense or something and says, okay, I'm not going to buy a phone. Like, I think that's realistic. But I mean, in the case of a, an average consumer that perhaps wants some basic protection or, or not even basic protection, but I think some basic guarantee, he has a bit of a point, right? Like we have seen instances, it has happened where, granted that I think the last 
time I heard anything like this was a few years ago. Uh, but we've had situations where you might have turned the phone and it just sits there and then suddenly it causes something, something causes it to power back on. And I'm not implying that that automatically implies you had a security failure, but it can happen. I have known it to happen as well. It happens with me as well a few times, but that only, in, it, it happens in certain, uh, so, you know, if, if for example, when I'm charging my phone and if it's in a switched off state and I uh, plug my phone in, uh, some phones power on to switch on the entire charging cycle so it can do the quick charge because those are processor level uh, functions that need the phone to be powered on for it to run it. Then all the other all the other situation, um, the phone will switch on because, you know, it's running certain processes in the background, but it's, I mean, I take it in faith that the phone is switched off and is only running the alarm in the background because it has a real-time clock with that function saying that, okay, when this alarm hits on, you need to power on and actually run the OS and switch on the alarm. That's the only time that I know that these these are the only two reasons that I would know that a, a switched-off phone would power on. And I think by extension, I think the question is coming from that, that area, right? Like you're taking in faith that these are the only two things that would allow that to happen. And he's potentially saying that, what if those are not the only two things that cause it to happen? And I don't know what the others might be, or there might be a third thing that I'm not aware of, something like that. And how do I make sure that when I say, I want the phone to be powered down and not, you know, have potentially a way of recording something I'm doing, or I don't know, whatever, uh, you know, how do I get that guarantee? So I think anyway, um, you know, just to summarize, I think um, Shaban had the suggestions for doing, um, putting it in the microwave, or actually, I mean, if you're really that, at that level, you want to take it that far, you can buy yourself a Faraday cage, which I think is fair. Like for me, the the only the only thing that would guarantee it is either you keep the phone outside the room or far enough from the ability to pick up anything or drain the battery out completely, in which case then even doesn't matter if there is any process running, like it cannot power on anymore. Thanks so much, Julie, for this question again. And if you have more follow-ups to this follow-up of your last question, you know, feel free to send them to us. I wouldn't mind some tin, tinfoil hat questions, actually. I quite enjoyed answering that one. It was completely, completely left field. Uh, that was not the kind of question I was expecting. So thanks to our listener for posting that. Yeah, I completely agree. It threw me off. I mean, I had to, really, I had to think about like, okay, wait a minute. Like, I don't recall the last time I even thought about it. We live in a time when we expect the phones to be on all the time. And we're so paranoid about the phone going off that the option of it going off voluntarily is scary. And, you know, it's funny because you were, you said the point about the about the alarm clock. And I've had situations where, and it's been a long time since I had this situation, but I have situations where like, I mean, if actually if you turn the phone off and even if there's an alarm, it won't turn on if there's no battery, right? Like the battery drained out. We'd be fuming at the phone, <laughs> you know, for like not doing its job, which I think is just funny. So um, yeah, we, we do live in interesting times. Being so polite, Chirag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, interesting is how I'll leave it. You know, as always, if you guys want to send us more questions, you can leave a comment on this episode's show page, which is going to be techtree.show slash eight. Uh, you can also reach us on Twitter at techtree, which is at T3CHTREE. We're going to quickly talk about Google I.O. before we get into, uh, you know, a couple of things that came out, I think, of this in terms of a larger conversation that I would like to have with you guys today. For the uninitiated, Google I.O. is basically Google's uh, annual... A developer conference where they unveil, um, you know, new information, new things, new features about their products, their services. Uh, and generally, they also talk about the new version of Android that's coming up. Um, Apple does something similar in the second week of June as well. Um, so I thought maybe what we could do uh, is each of us can just say maybe one thing that they thought that was that came out interesting, that's perhaps relevant or perhaps interesting to talk about. Um, and I'm going to start with Partha. Do you want to go first? The, the one thing that I really liked uh that google actually did far better than nokia have done so far or windows have done so far is the new ar version of google maps it's called street view ar basically so what they've done is that they've uh, they're using ai to uh, s smartly overlay the maps on a street view uh, on using the camera so it's basically a, a combination of google lens meets google maps it's, it's it's actually a really fascinating implementation of technology, giving you important information saying, okay, you need to walk in this direction. This is the right way for you to walk. Or here's the closest restaurant. This is a nice restaurant. That is a good restaurant. And it's, and it's kind of pulling information from all of the other Google uh, products that are out there. Uh, but one of the cutest things that I've seen on that entire Street View AR is basically you get an assistant that guides you 
in the form of a fox or something else that kind of pops up on the screen and walks with you on the phone and i think that's really really cute and it's done really well now there was a version of this that was announced um, on the windows phone um they had a maps that did exactly this but it didn't really pick up uh, that was also augmented reality but it didn't really pick up uh, very well because of the fact that the windows phone ecosystem didn't really pick up with the consumers either but um, i'm just saying that it's finally hit mainstream in, in the form of this street view ar and uh, i'm i'm really stoked about that it's it's really cute it's really really well done it's beautiful so i mean i saw i saw the you know the demos that they did about it and stuff like that um you know i'm curious i'm i'm just playing adversary for for no reason whatsoever um i mean you know i think google maps especially like for us here um is the de facto standard right in terms of using a mapping solution are you talking about yourself why what are you using ways who is bought by google like for me they're at the end of the day they're one company my my point being that like you know for the average public like it's google maps as opposed to some other solution i mean i see the kind of value i mean i think the the aspect about you know you waving your phone um it kind of using your pointing of the phone to tell you in which direction you need to walk i mean i saw the stuff where you know like you're sort of you have your phone pointed in front of a restaurant and it starts popping up information about the restaurant and stuff like that and i think i don't know part of me kind of feels like you know is it overkill i i can see how it adds some value but i i, I don't know i'm the feeling i got when i watched that was like good lord like okay that's too much information like if i want to look up a restaurant i'll look up the restaurant like i don't need you to keep popping that at me while i'm trying to like navigate you know here's another thing that actually i forgot to mention is that like you mentioned it's only for while you're walking so if you're in google maps and you're in navigation uh depending on which mode you take the street view ar overlay will pop up and by the way this is still not released officially there's still a ton of work that's going on in the background and there's no release date for this and i'm like but it's just you know the technology exists and they've done it so beautifully the execution was so uh, engaging like i want that today <laughs> okay uh shivan do you have anything to add to this no not really i think you guys have covered most of the points by the book um as far as the new features are concerned i guess i got my own few points on it uh, it was all right some some of them sort of stood out when i saw the keynotes uh, at least the highlights some were okay some i felt were as you said earlier i mean it's a great feature I, i'm sure that it's probably something that is in its uh, infancy right now but it's probably headed in a great direction um the, there are things that like i i remember when parth was talking about the navigation that that's useful having an uh, an ar guide sort of walk walk you around a city when you're lost that that is super useful cuz a lot of times you just you just need that little bit of a push so i think for for me that was that was something uh, that i liked there are a couple of things that i don't like uh, gmail has this stupid autocomplete thing that they're they're rolling out i just think that is just uh, unmitigated useless nobody asked for it and a lot of people at io were clapping and i'm sure there's a bunch of people that are obviously probably supporting this no no offense to those guys but you know what um we've come to that point where now we're doing auto replies on on pretty much everything uh email was the last line where you couldn't do it uh, and in fact google actually had these three buttons on on gmail already uh where you could pick and you could say hey thanks for this uh i'll respond back later um you know it's like your cancel your call and do your t- can't talk now what's up message quick responses pre-written responses that you can just shove into an email and then yeah it goes out yeah exactly yeah. it's like a quick response yeah yeah you just click one button and it types that text out for you and it sends it uh this is obviously taking that to a whole new level i don't like that i i would prefer for someone to take 2 seconds and just you know write the damn thing if it's a one liner that's it's a one liner or one ai uh, driven response maybe some day down the line but just nah i'm not ready for it mentally so yeah like i said i think there are some features that are probably if you look at the road map they're they're great they're going to be great in the future but right now mm, yeah we'll see see how it goes and mind you i'm not being critical for, uh, without any you know uh, without any reason do you remember a couple of years ago people were saying oh hey google glasses are going to be everywhere they're going to be everywhere you're going to wake up with fucking google glasses on i guess what that didn't really happen so um it is it is okay to be a little critical of of some of these features i think anyway that's my opinion 
No, no, absolutely. And I think, I mean, uh, I, I mean, this went on cue because, you know, I was hoping you would talk about Smart Compose, obviously. So that, 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 that went out really well. No, I think, though, I think, though, you're totally right, by the way. And I think that I think canned responses actually like they at least serve the purpose. I mean, we've all been there like, you know, we've I mean, and then I'm not talking just like IT support type stuff, but we've all been there, right, where you have this sort of the same thing. You're just responding to customers over and over again. And so there was value. But this is sort of taking predictive text and taking it to a new level, right? Like now not, you know, your phone or now your email rather um, you know is not stopping at like you guessing what word you're going to say but figuring out the entire sentence so you don't have to type anything at all and I don't know if this is a good convenience like I in fact on the contrary I think it's not a good convenience at all because uh, you know again the example that they did where they said okay you type your subject and, you know, you type Taco Tuesday and the moment you say, do you, like, it's going to figure out that you want to say, do you want to go get tacos? Like, I, I don't know. I don't I don't know. I don't think we were, don't, I don't think we're that. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't feel like we've reached that point where we need this, like. But you, you hit this, you've hit this nail on the head. This is my interesting freaking problem with, with the way things are going with, with in general, uh, with, with all of these ecosystems. They're trying to tell us, and again, Maybe my tinfoil hat is on right now, but they're trying to tell us and suggest to us what we should do. I don't want you to do that. Stay out of my business, you know. They're taking us for fools. Hey, here's Lyft. What, you know, the driver's like four or four minutes away. Thank you. I'll find my service provider that I want to use. Uh, the reason I see this is not about these features. I'm sure that these, th- these features are benign. It's about what it can possibly lead to in the future. And I'll give you an example of that. When Windows 10 was released, uh, you know, they were like, okay, Windows is now free. Yay. Uh, everyone gets a free copy of Windows. You know, everyone, they went Oprah Winfrey on everyone. And here's the problem now. Every time you get a goddamn update from Windows, they bundle shit in. They give you suggestions on your start menu. They put in adverts as a means to for you to pay for those features that you should originally be paying for. And again, software development costs money. I'd rather pay for that money and, and then be done with it. I don't want like ads show up on my Windows right now, even if you're using professional edition, by the way, or using enterprise edition. Uh, there was just a whole article on it a couple of days ago where people were upset because... Uh, these bundled games were showing up on on as part of Windows updates. So you'd get and check your computer now if you want. Uh, look for games you haven't installed that have suddenly magically showed up. Chances are it's part of an update, and you didn't install those games. But it's for Microsoft to tell those people um, that uh, tell their you know the vendors that hey you know what your game is being pushed out to like say thirty million people. Um, write us a check. Um, again, like I said, I'm sure this is not how it works, but. For me, it is not okay for something to be an update and to have a bundled game put in it without my explicit permission because it's my goddamn system. And if the same analogy applies to Google, and I hope to God, and I hope to God that they don't go down this route, but if you're giving people all these features that are free of cost, by the way, they cost nothing, um, there will be a cost somewhere. And, and, and we as consumers need to keep an eye on that because... I think we're starting to take too much shit for granted. And again, again, like I said, I always take a hardline stance in one of these situations. But um, my my ears are up now because um, with AI, it's it's a lot easier for some of these decisions to be taken out of your hands. And I don't, I'm, I'm not okay with that. Uh, actually, I think you've made great points. So I'm not going to add anything to it because I think we're going to talk a little bit more about it in a few minutes. So um, I, I think I want to point out that um, I, th- I thought it was an interesting theme. In fact, in connection with what you've just said, um, that you know Google spent a lot of time at this at this I/O and at the keynote talking about how they would help you detach from your technology as well. I, I want to throw some context here. So this is a conversation that's kind of been happening, I think, for about by the five or six months, roughly. Uh, sometime in January, uh, you know, two shareholders of Apple actually wrote this like very public letter. I mean, they sent it to Apple, but they also made it public about how they felt like Apple needs to take more responsibility in curing uh, smartphone addiction. And so Apple has been doing, I mean, they've been updating a bunch of like notifications and messages about things and da 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 But, uh, you know, to link this back to this conversation, which is basically Google kind of showcased this quite a lot, changing the way Do Not Disturb works, uh, you know, even going so far as to say that if you set a time that you want to sort of wind down to go to bed and stuff, like they'll turn your phone into gray- grayscale mode because studies have shown that like, you know, black and white turns you off in terms of using a phone compared to color. And so that's a way of kind of making you detach, looking at dashboards and statistics to try and um, make you more aware 
right, of what uh, your your phone usage is. And, I mean, we've seen bits and pieces of this happen over the years as well, uh, but they seem to make this quite a, quite a showcase feature. And I find this entire concept super interesting considering that we have all of this extra AI and extra stuff to make you use your phone over and over. Like, now, you know, like, not only will you be using your phone to just get a sense of direction, but now you will be live holding it in front of your face as you walk around. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's kind of an interesting, like, sort of overlap between, hey, here are all these awesome features that are going to make you use your phone a lot. And then, by the way, we're also going to track it so you, we make sure that you don't get addicted to your phone. And I thought that this, it's an interesting space where, um, you know, companies are talking about this in parallel with, you know, their keynote about announcing more features. The way I look at it, you're right. And it is kind of weird because you're like, on one hand, there's a problem. And, and honestly, you can't blame smartphone manufacturers for a lot of these problems. It is, at the end of the day, just the way society is right now. People are addicted to their phones. Uh, and it is a conscious choice. There are people I know who still maintain only single one single email address. And they run million-dollar companies. They're extremely successful in what they do. They're perfectly happy working on a Nokia old school 3110 because it, ne- it affects nothing. Their efficiencies are not affected at all by any technology, okay? They're just efficient people. Now, if you use technology to make yourself efficient, fine. Uh, but if you become reliant on technology and you sort of let technology do the thinking for you, that's a conscious decision that you make. And now these guys are having to solve those problems as well because people are like blaming them for it. And I don't think that's necessarily fair. Unless they're, you know, pushing an agenda where they try to get you addicted to these things. And then in that case, yes, that is part of their corporate social responsibility. If they're creating a problem, then they should be solving it as well. So people got to figure out where they lie um, uh, with this stuff. I also think that, yeah, they're making a lot of headway into uh, a lot of different things. I mean, if you look at the way they've the, in, incorporated uh, AI into the entire Android P, it's really smart. Like they've they've created adaptive brightness that understands how you engage with the environment, how the phone, how much battery, you, how much brightness you set on the phone in certain situations, and then does that automatically using machine learning. Then they're doing uh, app actions, which is basically, so uh, at one point in uh, Oreo, they had uh, these smart app uh, recommendations based on where you are or what you're doing or at at a certain point of time. Uh, Now they actually go to the next level and actually put actions linked to the buttons uh, instead of the app itself without you having to go into the app. So they're basically reducing uh, the number of clicks to complete that action within the application itself. I mean, the way they've used intelligence is really nice. And yes, it does help uh, reduce the uh, the addiction or the the need to kind of rely on technology or your phone to do everything because uh, you're technically using the device uh, less than you would normally but it's also counterproductive in the sense that you know you are now turning to your phone and um, uh, expecting it to get smarter so you'll have more time to play around with it because you know now you can yeah yeah i i, I agree with that too i mean i think I, in concept you might argue that like you're making your phone more efficient therefore it's going to take you two less minutes to navigate something right but i think that the two extra minutes means we'll, you'll check instagram for two more minutes right i don't think you're going to put your phone away for those two minutes and i think that that's <laughs> that's where the issue is so exactly i think the thing that uh, i think at least a couple of us want to definitely talk about and it's that google assistant phone call right um so um you know just to quickly summarize what happened there what google demoed was basically, you know, their smart assistant reaching a point where I, part one was actually the the voice is more humanized, right? And they, I don't want to get into a lot of that, but they have six new voices and it's supposed to sound like a lot. Oh my God, that that creeped me out. I'm sorry, I'm, but that just creeped me the hell out when I heard that smart AI. And they have six voices, including John Legend. Yeah, they have six. Yeah, six different voices. They've smoothened the voice out, and everybody's doing it. I mean, so you know, even Apple with Siri are trying to make it more more human, and and Alexa with uh, the indentations, the pauses, the fillers. That's I think that's that's what I want to talk about too. So they basically previewed a recording of the smart assistant making a phone call to try and get a, a hair salon appointment. So the, the invocation from the user was basically, hey, I want to get a, a salon appointment between 10 and 12 a.m. Uh, and make the call. And so it did. Um, I think what really created some cheer in the crowd or some ooze in the crowd, and I think Partha has just alluded to them here, is also like, so there was a lot of filler stuff. 
happening, I'll see you. Hi, I'm calling to book a women's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. Stuff like that, right? Uh, which is very, very human. Uh, but then also, the whole the whole point of the, I think that what they were trying to showcase as well was the fact that the, the assistant was able to respond to the questions despite the context and things changing throughout the conversation. So she started by saying, oh, I don't have something at this time. Can I book you somewhere else? And sort of, you know, re-back and mandating to, no, no, I want to do it between this time and this time. And then there was, a, I think, a follow-up question be like, okay, well, it depends on what she wants. The assistant was able to parse through the sentence saying, oh, what she wants is a, a woman's haircut right and then doing this whole conversation finishing the call ended it and that was the the preview tell me your initial feedback on on listening to that i first of all i find that the implementation of the technology was amazing what they have done is phenomenal what scares me is the realism that they have kind of implemented into it and like the person on the other end could not figure out if it was a bot or, or a real person I don't know if I should be happy or scared. I mean, it scares me, but it it it's. I'm actually at a loss for words to kind of explain what goes on in my brain every time I hear that. I've heard that conversation at least ten times now, by the way. I'm, and I was trying to figure out if there is some nuance or some way that I could identify that this was actually a bot, but there is nothing. By, by the way, there was, there's more than one demo. So there's, an, there's another demo that's floating around. And both of them, one was a male voice, one was a female voice. They both sound real. So I've, I've actually worked with uh, AI technologies where we had text-to-speech, uh, where we showed people how to do that. And we actually trained people on the different ways that you can actually modulate the speech. You know, So you could actually train the model to sound a particular way to inflect a particular way and it takes a lot of training and to do that but for it to proactively on the fly adapt and build that kind of conversation while i am extremely like keen on figuring out the technology it scares me that we have reached a space uh, you know technology will actually replace a human being to do something um, even as simple as making a phone call to make a hair appointment i mean wow it's just insane. I land actually in the positive side of things this time. I think it is not surprising. Uh, I think ever since people saw Iron Man and they saw the voice in the suit, they were like, okay, I want a Jarvis. You know, this it, it is great. I want a Jarvis. And Jarvis is now possibly here almost. It's, uh, it may be scary. I, I can see why. Uh, but I think personally, it's uh, pretty damn amazing that they've gotten it to that point because it, once it does get to that point, uh, it will start simplifying everyday tasks, I guess. It's reached that point where an AI like this that is completely fluent and understands you. And again, du- Duplex demo was, was the, the, the voice talking to the person. But there was another uh, update which basically uh, made con- conversing with it a lot more natural. And I think both things are leading to that point where you will get your own personal Jarvis as long as you can... Um, guarantee to people that Jarvis is looking out for your interests or is a benign, completely neutral entity, then yeah, absolutely. It's great. It's fantastic. I think in an ideal world, that's where should we should be headed. And and you know what? Kudos to Google. I mean, they've, they've been in the AI game for a long time. Uh, all, all those years that people spent put, uh, putting pictures on those jigsaws, trying to uh, for those captures online, they're, they're training AI in the background. And there's a whole bunch of other data that was used to train AI. And, and you see now what they've, they've been doing with it. And again, my, my concerns have always just been about privacy and about how much of it will interfere in your life as opposed to help your life or give you suggestions. But having said that, I think this, this new AI feature, uh, Duplex, I think it was amazing. I, I kind of expected, I think, in some ways for us to to feel that way about the technology in its raw form. I, I don't think anybody would say like, oh my God, I didn't imagine seeing it in my lifetime considering the way tech has been progressing in the last few years. So I think it was natural. Perhaps uh, maybe the only argument could be like, wow, I didn't expect to see it this year, right? I thought maybe it would take maybe another year or two before we saw this fluency in, in it all. But I have I have some concerns that naturally can be addressed. And I, I think that it was a demo at the end of the day. Um, I, I should point out as well that the, you know no release date on this as well was given. It was just like, hey, we've reached this ability where we can show you some samples of what we're able to do, which is fantastic. I was just wondering because I was thinking from the point of view of the poor person manning the desk at the hair salon. 
And I'm thinking to myself, like, you know, how far away are we from that world where we start doing this not because, you know, the tech's awesome and it helps us save time, but just because we couldn't be bothered? I, I don't know. Like, for me, it was it was so, like, like Partha was saying in a way, like, it was so creepy good that it makes me wonder, like, if I was at the receiving end of that call and I didn't know I was talking to a bot, how would that actually make you feel? I think if you if you didn't know you were talking to a bot, then they've done their job. And, and that's a great thing. But imagine things, this, uh, something, a version of this, a shitty version of this being put for fucking banking, for example. And then you call up the bank and you're like, hey, I have this problem. And it gives you a, a, a response and you're like, wait, wait, I'm sorry, but this is not what I, what I said to you. you know? You're not understanding what I'm saying to you. And you're like, oh, can you please make me understand? And then you go and you spend five minutes trying to make the damn thing understand what you're saying. And it does not compute. Of course, they would save millions in terms of customer service reps who would obviously lose their jobs thanks to AI. FYI, guys, if you're in customer service, beware. Uh, this shit's coming for your jobs, uh, possibly in the next five years, maybe sooner. It's already started, by the way. I know it has. But this like, natural sounding voice that your customers won't be able to know is a part. That's where the real money is. And the companies will pay for that. But the issue, again, is is the minute you're talking to a non-human being um, and that person doesn't understand your context, it could just could be a problem. It could be an exercise in frustration. If they do pull it off, it's a golden tool. If they don't, it's an exercise in frustration for everybody else in the receiving end. We've, we've kind of already gone through this in a way without AI, granted, but we, there was a time, uh, although I, I think, you know, the U.S. kind of saw its rise and fall like very quickly where, you know, they put all of these automated systems in front of their customer service reps. Right. So um, what you see today, I mean, you know, the banking systems here and stuff have been they've, they've stayed in the original form, which is you press a button to reach a certain department and get to a person. Right. Roughly, you can do some things through keypad entry, like you can pay your bills and, you know, certain things and select certain options. But when it came to like actually solving a problem, you were, you know, the, the automation of it was purely to direct you, you know, in the right box in terms of the department. But in the U.S. for, for many years, they tried doing this where they did a lot of like voice recognition and other stuff. And it was an exercise in massive frustration. So obviously, I can clearly see that this is a massive improvement on that. I mean, I trust Google to do their AI properly, which means that if they're saying that they can understand most of the context and i think in the example you gave shaban um actually that context it would work great while there is a lot of context that has to be picked up it is still within a limited space i mean you take an, a you know a telecom provider for example and there are a certain list of things that someone will call for and yeah occasionally you will hit an exception but that happens even when you're talking to humans sometimes to be frank and then certain context can be picked up to say like oh you know whenever a user does this um even though i got it wrong last time but you know it seems that the user want to go here. And so I'm going to do that this time. And I think that this is something where I think it's a clear win. Yes, we'll run into issues because not everybody will go with the Google solution. And so if they go with someone else or they, you, I'm sure you'll have all these mimicry providers, right? That will come up uh, either building on top of it or doing bad implementations of it or some version thereof. Um, so you, you, we will go through that. I think what Google was pitching, or at least it, what it looked like to me, and maybe I'm wrong, but what Google is pitching is to put that assistant in your hands like in the hand of the individual consumer as well and so that's where i start to feel like there are some some issues that for for want of a better word currently just creep me out because you know like i said i mean i could be receiving a call from um i mean if i'm if i'm working the front desk at a salon like i'm receiving a call on behalf of somebody and i'm not talking to a human being there's something inherently creepy about that to me and, and you're right because the the um, the bar to 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 identify if it is a success or a failure is the fact that I can't identify it. But the fact that I can't identify it, like, yeah, it just creeps me out. It's it's weird. Now, actually, here's the bigger problem, right? I'm if I'm gonna get a a call from any service provider or a, or a product that I'm using, for example, a company, I'm actually gonna be second guessing: is that thing an AI or a person? Like. That's the thing that's that's going to bother me more. Do you guys really think that, though? Honestly, tell me this. Because what you're talking about is a Turing test. And Alan Turing came up with this. It was basically, for those of our listeners that don't know what a Turing test is, again, I'm, I'm oversimplifying this, but it's a test where you talk to someone, uh, and it, it could be an AI, it could be a real person. And, and if you can't tell the difference, then the maker of the AI is basically succeeded in possibly creating something that is self-aware, completely smart, you know, is, is, is past that bar. And there are some machines now that have actually passed the Turing test. There's an asterisk there in what you just said, 
The Turing test requires the person at the receiving end to know that one among these people is an AI. And that's that's the difference. Okay. If I'm the person doing the testing, like at the receiving end of the test, um, in the lineup, whether it's one, whether it's two things or five things, whatever it is, you know, you're trying to confuse me to prove to me that one of these guys is an AI. But that's the thing. I know already that one of these guys is an AI, but I can't pinpoint which one it is. And that's the success of the Turing test. And for me, this isn't even in that, like the parameters are wrong because I'm asking my phone to call my hairdresser or, you know, some example thereof. Like, and that that's the issue I have with this is I don't know that I could be possibly talking to an AI. I did say that at the end of the day, we are, I'm oversimplifying that test. But if you can't tell, if you can't tell, and first of all, I, th- I don't think we're at that point where you can't tell. It, it is quite easy. It, 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 you ask it a com- complex question. Uh, I don't know. Um, where do you download all your torrents from? I don't know. Something weird, completely left field, right? Uh, ask it a political question, for example. Most of them will probably get thrown off in the, in the current state that they're in. And if they really are able to answer the, these super complicated, complex questions that require years and years and years of insight, then maybe what difference does it make? No, that's not what's happening here. That's my thing. Like, when you say that, like, oh, you can throw it off. But yeah, like, if I'm the person receiving the call at the hairdresser, no, my the parameters of my question are going to be within the scope of what the AI has learned. I'm not going to brand. And that's what Partha was saying. Then you're going to start second guessing. You're just going to start throwing, like, these curveball questions just to verify if you're talking to AI or a person. And you would only do that if it's if it's if if you're not going anywhere with it, right? Not necessarily. But why would you do it? Why would you deviate? And if you're getting what you want uh, at a faster rate from an AI versus a human being, what difference does it make? You're getting what you want. The AI gets what it's want. And you're you're okay with the fact that you don't know that maybe you did an entire transaction with that and a human being wasn't at the other end? And you don't know? Think of it this way. How many transactions do we do by pr- pressing in digits on our phones these days? Press one for this, press X for that, press Y for this. This is another way of doing it. We're just using vocal input as an input. Yeah, but you know that you're, you're dealing with automation. When you keep at entering things, like you know you're dealing with some automation. Yes. You, you understand the distinction. Here's a situation where you have no idea what the distinction is. And what difference does it make, Chira? Can you tell me what the difference is? Yeah, I, I don't know. It keeps me up. Okay. <laughs> maybe it's just my apprehension. Maybe, uh, maybe I won't care, by the way, yeah? three years later. Like, maybe I, I, won't give, I, I really won't care. Like, to me, I, and I know this is like, it's, it's a bit of this side of the kind of like point of view, because like, why am I thinking from the point of view of the poor person at the hair salon? Yeah, maybe I don't know why I'm thinking about it. But that's what I was thinking about when I was listening to that. And be like, damn it! Like, can you imagine receiving a call and just not knowing <laughs> that you're doing that? Especially when you're in a, you know, in a customer service space. Like, obviously, like if you were to set your AI to call me, we were setting up a, a recording. Let's say, right? Like, I know that I'm talking to your AI type based assistant, right? Like, I think it. I think the distinction is clear. I mean, if there's disclosure, I think I'd feel better about it. Probably. That's just me. No, it's not just you. It's not just you. Ah, uh, yeah. Maybe I think that's a personal reaction. I mean, everyone's gonna have a different reaction to this stuff. I think. I mean. Like, like you said, by the way, Shivan, and I, I, you know, honestly, like I, I kind of agree with you there. I think in a few years it won't matter. But right now, when I think about it, and I think this is to what Partha was saying, I think we'll start making some bad assumptions. We'll start second guessing things that are coming at us. We'll start throwing these curveball questions just to verify. And I think that that is not a, it's not a happy place to me. Like I think it's, it's just weird. I'd rather just know so I know what I'm dealing with and I can work within the parameters of it as opposed to like second guessing myself, wondering if I'm doing the right thing and then having to throw cobalt questions. I think it would make the whole customer service interaction like a pain. Yeah, but customer service interactions is just one one application of this tech. If you if you look at it in only in this one context, then yeah, absolutely, it will be a pain. But there's millions of other applications which probably will make life a lot easier. Yeah, yeah, of course. How of course many times have you called up a place and there's just nobody answering the goddamn phone? You know, that's that's a good thing that you raised because I think that's my distinction, right? I am perfectly okay with calling a service provider and getting in this situation. No issue with it. I am not okay with receiving a call and not being able to know what's going on. I think and that's my difference. And that is an important distinction. What bothered me most about the phone call uh, that we heard on uh, during the I.O. was that uh, the AI did not identify itself as an AI. And it was taken for granted by the other person that the AI is actually a human being. Now, like you said, kudos for the realism. I'm all for technology and I, I'm i the last person to stop technology because I, I work with, the, with technology and I'm teaching people how to do this. But will the AI identify itself and say, uh, excuse me, sir, but I am actually a smart AI assistant 
or I'm a smart AI bot or something of that sort before it continues a conversation. So just to point out, because what, how the AI introduced itself was saying, I'm calling on behalf of XYZ. And perhaps it was purely a demo point, right? Perhaps Google wants to just prove that, hey, if we don't tell you that this is AI, you won't know. And fair enough. Uh, but yeah, I think, I think it was not disclosed or it, the conversation was in full and very clear about not disclosing. No, there was a tickle ambiguity there. And I think it was put there on purpose. It was very well thought out. Do you, you think that these guys wouldn't like sit and work through every sentence that, that was said? I'm sure they have. Uh, and you're right. The, the, the whole point is there is a legitimacy that comes with a human being talking over the phone versus a robot. So they will never declare itself because if it does, that legitimacy is lost. And that is the human mindset right now. If a robot starts calling you at, let's say, I don't know, two o'clock in the mo- uh, two o'clock in the afternoon, right after your lunch, and you're in the middle of something versus a human being calling you, get, chances are you will take the human being more seriously than a robot. Over time, that mindset will change because it also depends on how widespread it gets because if it, this is a common thing and the robot's calling on behalf of some CEO, you will take that damn call. It really depends on the context. And, and this is uncharted territory. So, yeah, I don't think a lot of these AI will will declare themselves. Maybe they should, but it, it could affect how you see them. Again, coming back to the, that, that thing is if you can't tell the difference and if you are getting what you want, then does it really matter? No, it's, that's a, it's a fair question, by the way, Shaban. I read them, you know, not in disagreement. Um, I just I, I think I want to just add here that like there is a kind of a reason why we haven't really touched on privacy angle about this whole thing and stuff like that. And I think the reason, um, you know, it, it's sort of deliberate. We didn't bring it up because I think the privacy questions or the core privacy concerns we may all have are, I think, still the same. And we've discussed them in multiple episodes. We kind of touched on them a little earlier while we were talking about Google I.O. as well. Here's the thing that I feel about. There's actually no, not so much of a privacy issue in this entire thing. Purely because the AI is going to only work off the information that you feed it, right? Don't know. Yeah, but there's a privacy implication there by definition. Let me give an example, the Partha. So, you know, now a couple of years ago, Motorola came up with that phone that had that chip that could only listen to your voice. It would constantly stay on. So they marketed that. I don't remember. Maybe you remember what it was called. But the, the whole point of it was that you wouldn't have to wake up your phone and press the power button uh, to say something to your phone to get it to recognize. And this was only for, for Android, by the way. I don't know if there was an iOS equivalent. And then uh, a couple of years later now, it's just a norm. You expect your phone to now, you can unlock it with your voice. Uh, you can talk to it at any time without touching it or interacting with it because the microphone is always listening. And that's where the privacy impl- uh, uh, um, impl- make, um, implication comes in. Because now that we're going to be so used to AI and used to this sort of video, audio, sensory input, that those inputs are always going to be on. So that camera in your house is always going to have to be on or the microphones are constantly have to be on. Um, even if they claim to process all the data locally on your phone and they don't transmit it anywhere, it doesn't matter. It does open up a loophole potentially for someone else to exploit it. No, even the same example, right? Like, I mean, uh, the parameter given was very finite, like give me an appointment in 10 and 12, but I could just as easily have said, give me an appointment tomorrow. And then the AI would have to go and check my calendar to figure out what it is and might actually say something like, well, you can't do it at 10 o'clock because he's meeting X and Y at this location. And then poof, like now suddenly like somebody external knows what I'm doing at 10 o'clock for no reason of mine, except for the fact that I have to give the AI access to my calendar to be able to make this appointment. If I have full control over every piece of information I'm feeding it, then great. But we already know that that's not how this works, right? I don't think that it's, oh my God, like we're we're all screwed. Well, maybe we are, I don't know. But I think it's more like, yeah, there, there is a privacy concern there, but I think it's not a new privacy concern. I think it's the same thing has been talked about. And I think it is something that will have to get addressed. All right. Well, um, I don't know. So I'm still a little creeped out, but hey, uh, <laughs> I still I can't I can't stop thinking about this. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, but but anyways, we've kind of talked amongst ourselves as well, and I think we're we're going to give um, AI in its larger context. Um, I think some more addressing in coming weeks. We also have a very exciting episode for you next time, so I'm super excited to record that. But we'll kind of you know we're just teasing it to you now, but we'll see you know when we put it together. Um, you can find this episode show notes at techtoo.show slash eight as well as in your podcast players. So feel free to subscribe to us. You can also reach us on Twitter at DeckTree, which is at D3CHTRE. Shaban, if you want to share your contact details as well. So you can reach me on Twitter at Airspective. That's A-I-R-S-P-E-C-T-I-V. And yeah, thanks so much for tuning in this week. And Partha. 
So you can reach me on Twitter as P A R T H A N S, and uh, yeah, uh, we're constantly working with AI and stuff. And if you feel that you need some questions answered, or if you're looking for any more information, uh, don't forget to write to us uh, on Tech Tree. That's T three C H T R E E, like uh, Chirag mentioned earlier. Yeah, it's like, why are you doing my job, man? Hey, because somebody else has to also. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Uh, I'm available on Twitter at Chagandi. That's at C H I R A G N D. We'll be back in two weeks. Goodbye. All right, guys. Fantastic. Thank you. Bye, bye, guys. Bye.